Welcome back to the local footy show, and if you're any sort of football follower, you will know the name Fred Cook, a legend in VFA football, Port Melbourne superstar, and uh, there's just been a brand new book written about him, The Stripe and Times of Fred Cook. We're joined on the show by author Paul Amy and the man himself, Fred Cook. Welcome, fellas. Thank you so Thanks, much. Yeah. Well, a little while in coming, because uh, a lot of people have uh, wanted this sort of book written about the champion. Paul, how did it come about? Uh, well, Daryl, um, you know, I, I intended this year to write a book of, you know, about some BFA greats, what I was going to call, say, Sunday Bloody Sunday, or When Sunday Was King, just a gallery of BFA mm -hmm. greats, you know, because, you know, I used to love watching the old BFA and um, got back from overseas in January and uh, Freddie contacted me and said he heard that I was doing a book. I think Scotty Palmer had told him and uh, Freddie said, well, how about you tackle mine first? And uh, I thought, yeah, let's, let's do it. So, Fred, how did you feel about uh, a book being written about your life? I, I'd attempted it a couple of times over the last 20 years and uh, I suddenly realised that there had to be so much put into it, so much research. Um, and as I found out with Paul, you know, he inter interviewed nearly 100 people from, you know, from teammates back. I had Nozo the first grade, John Schultz and... Um, I can't think of any of Gary Dempsey. Sparger, yeah. Gary, Gary Dempsey. Um, and uh, it wasn't until we got into it, I thought, geez, this is going to be a challenge, you know. It's a, and the bottom line was, we'd always said, got to tell the truth. Got to tell the truth. You know, otherwise it ends up, it ends up another football book. You know, it's another football, and it doesn't matter whether it's um, cousins or somebody out there, they just gloss what over. We've got to tell the truth, you know. And um, we got through that, didn't we? We got through that. It was difficult. I wasn't happy about it, but as we said. So you had to overcome some some demons to oh. to spread bear for the for the public. You know, I had to put in the book in the book. I used to give my wife, wives a clip. You know, others. You know, the backhander. You know, I think that was pretty smart because that was the way. You know, men reacted in those days. You know, I didn't know any better. Uh, and. Yeah, I heard so many people along the way, God. You, you, you played for Footscray, you went across to Yarraville, you won a Liston Trophy at Yarraville, mm -hmm. then the heart attack. Yeah, and then uh, I, uh, I come back to the last game of the year, I think, and kicked the quick 16 goals. But yeah, anyone's allowed to have a bad day, you know. <laughs> yeah. you know you know, can't be good all the time. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, they wouldn't play me earlier, Ports. I mean, gosh, wouldn't pay me, play me because I was, they couldn't chew me. And uh, that was the, the difficult early doors. And uh, I was frustrated, you know. Uh, I, I said, oh, my God, I said, look, play me or clear me, you know, this is just getting... Away. And suddenly the, um, the rest is history. One thing we never put in the book, um, in 1977, when uh, um, North and... Um, Collingwood played Drew, the draw. Drew, I said... I said uh, um, um, in the media and uh, to Jack Hamill and Michaela, why don't you let Port Melbourne play Fitzroy in the curtain raiser? Oh, no, 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 no. Many years later, I barreled Jack Hamill up and said, mate, yeah, it's, a, it's a good idea. Why? He said, Fred, was shit frightened that you'd probably Port Melbourne and Bob up and beat him. They couldn't handle that. No. And that's, that's the only reason they wouldn't let Port Melbourne play Fitzroy in the curtain raiser. But that VFL and VFA rivalry really helped the way that the VFA promoted itself. And, and it just took off from that, didn't it? I think a lot of it has got to do with Phil Gibbs at Channel, at Channel O. He, uh, he saw an opening on, on a Sunday um, and uh, he encouraged the, the violence to, to a certain extent. You know, if something was, it looks like it'd been an ordinary game, he'd come in and do something, do something stupid out there. Oh, come on, Phil. You know, look. Well, if he encouraged the violence, he did a pretty good job because there were some pretty uh, rough old games and Port Melbourne and Dandenong was usually at the forefront. Oh, it, um, it, it, that football was like pretend war. It was pretend war. You know, the, the only reason we have sport in our society today is because it was invented because... In between wars, they used to have these uh, the Olympic Games and had to keep them. But it was bloody pretend war, it really was. And so 
So how did you get on with, say, the blokes from Dandenong? Um, oh, the, I think there was a, there was a mutual respect there. Uh, but you knew it was, you knew you were in for a hard game. You, you knew, in certain days, you'd just, sort of, uh, the media build up and you think, oh, yeah, I don't need this. Paul, did, tell us, did you, sorry, Paul, did you um, interview people from Dandenong, like Harper, who, who uh, for him, knocked Freddie from King can come, didn't he? Yeah, in no, grand final? It, in the 76 grand final, I mean, it's probably one of the most, you know, famous or infamous grand finals of all. Uh, you know, we tracked down uh, Big Al Harper, um, you know, who had a couple of uh, uh, clashes um, with Port Melbourne players, or incidents, as he calls them. Uh, so, you know, um, he had, had a clash with Big Fred and he clashed with Norm Brown. I mean, um, we spoke to Alan, we spoke to Paddy Flaherty and, you know, some other people, so there's quite a bit in the book about that 76 um, uh, grand final. Taylor's top one right in the mouth. And what's the umpire going to do? Cook's been flattened. And it's right on. Harper is in trouble. And look at the players going downfield. The umpires are there. Let's watch this. And it's on. Another player is flattened the other end of the ground. Flaherty's been flattened at the other end of the ground. And there's another one down at the other end. A train has gone down. And Eddie Melee's uh, standing around. In the middle, there's another fight on in the middle of the ground. Oh, look at this slinging match. One needs to have eyes in the back of the head here. And it's on again in the centre. And there's a free kick going here, Ted. Would it go out of bounds uh, on the fall? Wouldn't there's a free kick going to Rasmussen anyway. Oh, there's something behind yeah, the play oh, again. Behind the play again. Norm Brown and Alan Harper are flat on the ground. And it's on again. And down goes uh, Thompson of Dandenong. Maybe tell the chaps about uh, your recollections of that famous... 76 grand final. I'm going to buy a book. Yeah. <laughs> Give them a teaser, Fred, and they'll all go out and buy fabulous Fred. Uh, on the uh, Thursday night, Alan Harper, full-back for Dandenong, he said to his teammates, he said, if Cook starts to make a pool of it, I'm going to knock him out. Now, that's fine. He told everybody, but he didn't tell me. I, I <laughs> could have come to some arrangement. You know? <laughs> and uh, anyway... Billy Swan came out the middle, kicked the, the ball into the goal through, and I took it, turned half a step, and kicked it through. And that's when he knocked me out. And Billy Swan, you know, expecting a bit of sympathy from him, he turned around and said, if you let, hadn't been such a selfish bastard and let the thing go through, he said, everyone, he wouldn't have knocked you out. He said. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, just that particular day, it was just uh, police horses. God. Was that frightening? I remember in 1974, a, um, there was a, a bloke, Daryl Herod played for Geelong, come across the port, and we're in an Oakley Grand Final. Um, there was a big punch up, and there's Tommy Quinns and really tough people. Uh, Mick Irwin went to punch Tommy Quinn on, on the chin, and the police horse come in between them, and he punched the police horse in the bum, and the police horse jumped on me for it. <laughs> oh, I've, got a, I've got a paralysed foot because of the police horse because he punched him on the nose. But uh, every week, every week, you would expect something to, to fire up, you know. It can be something, something just minimal, you know. It um, gets up someone's nose and they just, just have to lash out. Another one now, I've got to the goal square by himself. Oh, there! Got it and he got dropped. I think. And they uh, got dropped too, look. And they're coming from all for the field. And this is a real ball, this one. Boundary umpires are in there, there's players flat out on the ground. You, you were a media star, regular world of sport performer, a VFA legend. You had the world at your feet, successful hotel. Where did it go wrong? I wasn't a really nice person, I really wasn't. Um, you know, it's all right. To be all flowers and on the outside, but, you know, I wasn't a good good father at home, you know, I was never home, I used to buy, buy my children. Um, and, you know, I tried to learn later on, but 
it was, it was too late by then. You know, I thought, I thought I'd, the kids liked the footy and, and I always, always had the money to take them away on holidays and um, buy the things that the other kids didn't have. And I think back in those days, the kids were very important to me. It sounds corny, but the kids were very important. You know, Port Melbourne, single mother, and ministry houses, and, you know, they haven't got very much going from. So the garden light was sort of me. And I had this, um, I really had an interpersonal relationship with him. You know, there was one young kid, his name was Tommy Turtle. Turtle. He's about 12. And uh, he was my best mate. As soon as I pull up at the ground, he'd there, give us the keys, cookie, he'd get the, open the boot and get me bag out and open my boots up and have everything ready. And uh, um, I, I spoke to his mother one day after a game. He's a fair little thing. Wasn't going to school, swearing at his mother, not doing homework. And, then, and next day he came out, oh, okay, come along. I said, hey, see you later, Tommy. I said, hey, even I had to listen to my mother. I said, when I find out, I said, you go away and learn a bit of respect. Come back and see me then. I just wiped him. And I kept in touch with his mother. And uh, within a week, he was getting up at six o'clock, going to school, making his own lunch. It was terrific. And one day, he was sulking at the gate one day. I said, Tommy, I've heard some good things about you. Just do me a favour and pick up my bag. He's my friend again, you know? And uh, there's so many other kids like that. They, uh, yeah, I suppose they looked up to me because I took an interest in them, you know? We'll be back with more of the strife and times of Fred Cook after the break. As we return to the strife and times of Fred Cook. I had my heroes in Ted Whitten, John Pachura, people like that, you know, old, old people I used to look up to. Um, and I wasn't going to, I was going to destroy it for the, for the young kids that um, who were uh, following me playing at Port Melbourne. But where did it get off the rails? Probably, yeah, about 85, I think, 85, 84, 85. Um, uh, I could run, I could run like a dozen excuses. I was working too hard at the pub, you know, the hours, that's rubbish. Um, uh, turning point, I was one Friday night, I was at the pub, I was at a car, my nose was stuffed up, and I had to go and do a sportsman's night with Bill Laurie, John Snow, the English fast bowler. And uh, oh, uh, this dead someone said, uh, I said, oh, I can't do it yet. He opened a plastic bag, put a pen knife in it, and put a bit of powder in my Bacardi and Coke. And I thought, if I take twice as much, I'll feel twice as good. And here we are today. <laughs> That's what it was all about. Yeah? I, I didn't take drugs because I hated them and they're no good to you. I took them because I loved them, you know? And, you know, if, if, uh, if you could... Teach me how to deal with the consequences. You know, I'm on eight or nine different types of medication. The only thing I'm not on is the birth control at the moment. <laughs> you know, if I take an aspirin now, I'm buggered. It's God's way of saying he hates drug addicts. But, um, I was gonna, sorry, it's a warts and all look at the life of Fred Cook. Paul, and then, how, and do you, how do you <coughs> work with Fred? How do you draw those things out that he'd probably not be happy talking about? How hard is that working together on a on a warts and all book? <clears throat> oh, well, look, Darrell, we said from the start that if, you were, if you're going to do a book about Fred Cook, um, then you've, you've got to tell it all, because that, that's what people want to read, you know. Um, they want to know about Fred, and they want to know all about him. Um, it's, it was an interesting process. I mean, we'd go down to, I'd go down to Mornington once or twice a week and you know, tape record and... Uh, you know, Freddie's, um, uh, Freddie's got a million stories. I mean, they, they gush out of him like a tap. And it's just a matter of, was a matter of trying to trap them all and sort of find a place for them and, and try to line it all up. But, um, look, it was a terrific experience. I mean, you know, we rang a lot of people, met some people, and uh, one thing they all say about Freddie is, um, how is Freddie? And I think what they want to say is, is Freddie off drugs? Um, you know, there's just, just always got a sense that there was a you know, real deep reservoir of affection for him. Um, and, you know, people all, all, always said that the, at the height of his powers and his popularity, he was always a generous fellow, generous with his money, gener generous with his time. And 
and people haven't forgotten it. And I mean, we were down at Port Melbourne a few weeks ago when he was, um, they named an end of their goals after him. And uh, I mean, he's still Mr. Popular uh, down there at Port Melbourne, and I think it makes Freddie feel good. Was there any surprises in it all, Paul? Oh, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know about uh, Fred. I mean, you know, when I was a little tacker, I um, you know, used to watch the VFA and, uh, you know, I used to love watching Fred because he, he sort of seemed to save his best for the TV cameras. He was always kicking big bags of goals or, you know, the snaps and the marks and that. But, oh, there was a lot of, lot of stuff in there that, you know, I, I didn't realise the extent of his, of his drug problem. I, you know, I thought he might have... I knew he'd been to jail, but I didn't know he, he did three separate stints or that he was, you know, he was, um, you know, on speed for, you know, the best part of 20 years. Um, you know, look, ultimately, um, uh, it's, a, it's a sad story, Freddie. Um, he's a, he is a lovely fella. Um, he'd, he'd give you uh, the shirt off his back in a blizzard, but when you think of where he was... And uh, and how far, how far he fell, it's uh, it's it's terribly sad. But you know, I still think there's a redemptive curve, a redemptive arc to his story. Probably can't be told yet because, as Freddie says, it, it's a it's a battle for him every day to sort of uh, to stay clean, to stay off drugs, and to resist that temptation. But stay unmarried. Stay unmarried. I'm married for all time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I'm going to get, excuse me. I'm going to get married one more time. What was that? I couldn't stand the thought of going through the rest of my life happy. <laughs> <laughs> Just one more time. <laughs> well, there is an upside to all of this, and that is that you have been clean for a long time now, Fred. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've lost the uh, the um, excitement's gone out of it. <laughs> it really has. You know, I'd rather. Go and, uh, I was a cup of coffee and watch the late news on ABC. No, I don't watch football shows. I watch this one, of course. But um, I, uh, yeah, the game's changed. The game's changed and they will change every generation. But it's uh, a little bit soft and a little bit, a lot of rules that uh, probably shouldn't be there. And we do it because half the people that watch the game are women and they've got little kids that. I don't want to get knocked about, and I understand that. Uh, but just, just don't take the, don't, don't pick the game up. Don't pick it up. Sam Newman was um, was a ma good mate of yours, and he's written the forward for the book. Mm. You, you still got good friends there? Well, he had to write the forward because otherwise I would have slandered him in the book. You know, they, <laughs> we went on a lot of adventures together, <laughs> John Newman and I, a lot of adventures. Is there a few in there? Have you put a few in? No, I'm not uh, sure. No, no, no. We'll do that for book well, two. We'll do that for book two. Well, I was just going to say, it might be a follow-up because oh, uh, look, there's uh, so much to tell about the Fred Cook story. I just said to Paul, um, 1970, 71, Ted Whitten was going to come across and play with Paul Melbourne. Ted Whitten. Oh, Ted Whitten. And nobody knows that because he was training at North Melbourne. Whitten, when he got sacked at Footscray, he was training at North Melbourne under... Bro uh, Smith, uh, Brian Smith, Brian, Brian, Brian Dixon. Dixon. Brian, of course it was Brian Dixon. And uh, he was trying to know me, and he went and got sick of thought he wanted to take him down the channel and do this. And I said, well, why don't you come over, come over and have a run to port? So anyway, uh, EJ, me and old man Goss sat down and um, <laughs> he didn't want to pay Witten $250. <laughs> 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 I'll pay you 200 He said, cool, he's getting 200 I don't even, you know. And, uh, it was touch and go, but then work commitments come up with out of this, and uh, an immediate, uh, and he couldn't do it. But he was really going to, you know, he said, hey, Bucket, he said, you can stand in the pocket, I'll stand in front of it. He said, call me Bucket now. He said, I'll stand in front of the goals, and you stand in the pocket. I was quite happy with that. <laughs> I was quite happy with that, because, you know, he's a great man, a great footballer. Well, lots of great stories, there are lots of great anecdotes in here, mm. but it's also a compelling read because it tells the story of a... Uh, a man who's been right up to the top and down to the depths and fighting his way back. And well, brilliantly I, written. I can honestly say I've wined and dined with Prime Ministers, two of them, and I've lived with some of the lowest people on earth in Pentridge Jail, and I've met everyone in between. Most of them are nice people. <laughs> they really are. Yeah, yeah we've all got our frailties. Um, and most importantly, my kids think I'm a good bloke. That's good. Yeah. Well, Paul, you've done a Fantastic job. Congratulations on what is a compelling read and a must 
for not only every footy fan, but every, everyone who likes to uh, to read about a uh, well, one of the more famous lives in Australia, Freddie Cook, VFA legend, 1,300 goals, and uh, four wives. Four wives. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the four wives. Well done, Paul. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, well done, Paul. Well thanks, done. Fred. Thanks for joining us, the local footy show. Thanks, fellas. Thank you so much. Fabulous, Fred. The Stripe and Times of Fred Cook available. Now, where? Available in all bookshops all and, bookshops. Uh, you know, all the online outlets, yeah. All good bookshops and some that aren't all that good. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you get your copy. Thanks, fellas.